Welcome, Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Swiss Resource Virtual Roadshow here from Heresau in Switzerland. And with me is here today, Victoria Gold and John McConnell, the CEO, is here with us. Good morning, John, to Canada. How are you doing? Good morning, everyone. Yeah, great to see you. Great to have you here with us. We will start in a second. First, let the, the attendees here check in. Um, and also let me, uh, hang on, I'm just looking here on that. Yeah, great. Okay, people are checking in. That is great. So, yeah, first of all, very warm welcome also from my side. My name is Jochen Steiger. I'm the founder and CEO of Swiss Resource Capital AG and also the founder and chief editor of Commodity TV and Rohstoff TV. It's my honor and pleasure to moderate today this session with, with, with uh, Victoria Gold. And we are fully complying to the data security laws of Europe, but also Switzerland and United Kingdom. And uh, nobody can see each other. Nobody can see emails or names. That's very important. So everybody uh, uh, is uh, fully protected and John will start in a second. I really um, yeah, advise you to use the chat function or the Q&A only function to uh, type your questions in. That would be great because John will present approximately 25, 30 minutes and afterwards we want to have a lively Q&A discussion. So let me bring up the presentation here and then I would say, John, the floor is yours. Enjoy the show, ladies and gentlemen. Again, uh, hello, everyone. It's John McConnell, President and CEO of Victoria Gold. I'll take the next uh, 20 to 30 minutes and walk through our corporate presentation, and then we'll have time, lots of time for Q&A. Uh, usual forward-looking statement. Um, investment highlights. Uh, most of these I'm going to touch on in the in the thing, but Really uh, want to talk about growing up to 200,000 ounces per year. Uh, got lots of photos in the presentation, so I hope you'll get the impression that this is a best in class heap leach operation. Um, you know, we generate significant cash flow. As a matter of fact, last year we paid down over 60 million in debt. I'm going to talk about uh, exploration and a new discovery we've made called Raven and uh, talk about ESG a little bit. So here's our location. We've uh, got a map here of uh, the Yukon Territory. Um, you can see geographically we're roughly in the center of the territory. Uh, Year-round road access. Uh, there's a hydroelectric dam at the community of Mayo, and we use hydroelectric power. Um, the community of Mayo is small, but uh, more, most importantly, it has a full-service airport, which our employees go in and out of uh, with shift change. Uh, the capital city of the Yukon, Whitehorse, is about a six-hour drive away, depending on who's driving. Um, and the port of Skagway is about eight hours away. This is a shot of the mine site. Ta start in the top right, you can see the open pit here. Um, we come to haul down to the primary crusher, over to the secondary and tertiary crushers. And we have a long 1.5 kilometer overland conveyor to the heap leach pad here gold recovery plant, and then down in the bottom is it, the camp. From here over to here is approximately five kilometers. So it's a you know big site, but it's very efficient. And you know in a pickup truck, you can visit all the active areas in a half a day. Uh, mining, uh, we mine to a pretty rigid plan. We don't have a lot of flexibility. The deposit is well behaved and very consistent. Um, and I think you can see from the, we're currently mining in phases two and three, and all our halls or halls are downhill to the primary crusher. Um, we have short halls to the waste dumps. Um, very low stripping ratio at less than one to one. Uh, we have an entire Caterpillar fleet. As a matter of fact, our uh, two shovels were built in Germany by Caterpillar. <laughs> uh, we built a new truck shop uh, last year. We had hoped to build it two years ago, but 
We were hampered because of COVID, but we're already seeing it make a big difference in equipment availability with a nice, dry, clean area for the guys to maintain the, the gear. Uh, crushing and stacking, uh, again, in the crushers, we've used top quality uh, Metzl equipment. We crush the ore to 10 mil, and not a lot of people were very highly automated. Uh, over here is the leach pad. Uh, when we started this leach pad, it was the shape of a uh, martini glass. And in the bottom, we were almost stepping on ourselves. So it was very difficult, the stacking process, and not very uh, efficient. But now you can see we have a very large area, and uh, it's a very efficient stacking. Um, gold recovery plant, I won't walk you through the process. Uh, we produce dory bars on site. Those dory bars are about 85% gold, 10% silver, and 5% uh, a whole bunch of other things, uh, primarily tin, I think. Uh, we ship those dory bars to the Royal Canadian Mint, and they're refined there, and we produce... Uh, 99.99 uh, gold bars. Um, so we've guided the market that will produce somewhere around 160,000 ounces of gold this year. Um, but the nameplate capacity is 200,000. Uh, so how are we going to get there? Well, mining is not an issue. The leach pad is not an issue. The ADR or gold recovery plant is not an issue. The problem preventing us from getting to 200,000 uh, ounces per year is availability of the crushing system. Um, currently, if I take from the primary crusher through to stacking on the pad, the equipment availability is somewhere between 70 and 75%. And that gives us 160,000 ounces per year. What we have to do is get that availability up to 85 to 90%, and that will give us the 200,000. So how do we get there? One, there are some design improvements, and I'll give you an example of a change we made this past August. We have a conveyor that runs under the tertiary crushers. That conveyor, if it was shut down, fully loaded because of an upset, um, we'd spend 12 hours shoveling it off because the motor wasn't large enough to start the conveyor fully loaded. So that happens, say, 10, 12 times a year. Uh, 12 hours shut down, that's a lot of lost production. So the solution was put a second motor at the head end of the conveyor and drive, and now we can start up that conveyor fully loaded and not have that have to shovel it off. So that's one example, and we've got about six that we want to do in the plant, similar to that. Um, the other issue is uh, people. Um, you know, we're operating with less than the ideal number of people on site, and I'm sure Germany's the same as North America. There's help wanted signs in uh, every, uh, every store and restaurant. Um, we're no different. Uh, we're short people and we have higher turnover. And that means people are just are not as productive as they should be. So how have we addressed that? We've uh, increased our recruitment team and increased our training capacity. The other area is everybody's heard of supply chain issues. Uh, it's not unique to uh, North America. I know that. Uh, um, so we've had to adjust our inventory of parts. We've increased our inventory from roughly 20 million to over 30 billion over the past year. And, you know, I'm hearing fewer and fewer complaints about not having the right part at the right time. Um, we think there's potential still to go above 200,000 ounces per year. Um, the difference here is that 
to get there will cost us some money. There'll be some capital equipment involved. But again, mining's not an issue. The leach pad is not an issue. And the gold recovery plant is not an issue. It's the crushing and stacking system. So we're going to increase our stacking to 11 months per year. We're looking at alternatives to take fines out of the circuit ahead of the crushing circuit, which would give us more capacity through the crushers. And then the third thing we're looking at is adding a semi-mobile crusher. You could see an example of one in the middle photo there. And it wouldn't have the same capacity as our existing plant, but at least when we shut down for three or four days of maintenance, we'd be able to stack some material on the pad. Two questions you should ask any new mine operation. Number one is how's the grade reconciling? Um, we sample the production blast holes and we have a belt sampler on the material going out to the leach pad. We assay those samples and we reconcile those right back to the original block model. And I'm pleased to say we're seeing excellent reconciliation. So you can tick the box on grade. The second question you should ask is how's the metallurgical uh, reconciliation uh, in terms of recovery? And I'm pleased to say again, we're seeing recoveries probably higher than uh, what we used in the feasibility study. Life of mine, the feasibility study had 73% recovery. We're probably seeing somewhere around 75 to 76. So again, another positive. Um, we've also uh, already started looking at expansion of Eagle. Uh, we always knew the ore body was open at depth, but we hadn't drilled it off at depth. Um, the current pit is planned to about 350 meters. We've now drilled 32 holes down to roughly 800 meters, and the mineralization at similar grade continues. So we're now working through the economics of laying back the, uh, particularly the east high wall, and increasing the strip ratio, which would allow us to expand, extend the mine life by five to 10 years. We're also been looking along strike from Eagle, particularly to the west. And uh, earlier this year, we drilled 23 holes. And uh, indeed, the ore body does extend to the west. So we're now doing the engineering and planning required to extend the open pit further to the west. And I, my gut tells me we've added uh, probably two to three years to the uh, reserve along strike. Now, regional exploration. You know, we've had this property since 2009, and all of our focus has been on Eagle, uh, you know, develop, exploring first, then developing, and now uh, operating it. But we have a large land package uh, in the Yukon, over 550 square kilometers. And uh, we've been systematically doing exploration for the past three years. We started with airborne geophysics, where we had anomalies. We followed up with ground geophysics and ground geochem. We're currently focused on an area out to the east. It's another large granodiorite intrusive called Nugget. And the reason we focused on it is the intrusive has very similar characteristics to the intrusive that hosts Eagle. And indeed, in 2018, through trenching and prospecting, we made a new discovery out there that we call Raven. It's on the south uh, corner of the intrusive. Uh, we spent uh, uh, 2019, 20, and 2021. We had modest programs out there because of COVID, but we drilled uh, 78 holes and 18,000 meters. And a month ago, we announced the maiden resource out there, 20 million tons at one point. 
seven grams per ton, which gives us just over a million ounces. Um, it's very positive because it's roughly two and a half times the grade of Eagle, and it's still open in all directions. This year, uh, we had a very large program out there. Uh, we drilled over 25,000 meters in 90 holes, and you can see the, the red here is the um, resource currently. But we've now mapped this granodiorite intrusive. It's very large. We've put in a lot of step-out holes, and uh, we'll announce a new or calculate a new resource over the next few months. But I'm certain we're going to go to multi-million ounces out here. And indeed, you know, it's early days. It's encouraging. But I think we may have a tiger by the tail out here. Um, so I mentioned earlier that we generate a lot of free cash flow. Um, so what are the uses of that cash flow? Well, number one, this year, we've reinvested in the business. Uh, we've built a water treatment plant that cost us about $30 million. Uh, we've added uh, additional haulage capacity. We bought two new trucks at, uh, I think, roughly $6 million each. We've put in a fleet management system. I talked about some of the crushing plant modifications we've made. And then of course, there's the drilling uh, at depth and a long strike at Eagle. So we, our sustaining capital this year was probably 60 to $70 million. Uh, that drops next year to uh, closer to 30 million. So. You know, our focus is always going to be on debt repayment. Uh, as I mentioned, in 2021, we paid down 60 million. We'll pay down 40 million this year. And then hopefully, if uh, old prices cooperate, we'll pay down a large portion of the debt in 2023. Looking longer term, uh, we'll consider things like share buyback programs and dividends but also investments in junior explorers. Uh, shareholders, uh, you can see the uh, registry here. Um, you know, two years ago, we were probably 80% uh, retail. Um, that's really changed over the past 12 months. A lot of institutions have come into the stock, in particular buying out Orion Mine Finance, who at one time held up to 40%. Um, personally, I own almost 800 million or 800,000 shares. And, uh, you know, it's important that you know I purchased every one of those shares in the market. We didn't IPO this company and give ourselves a bunch of founder stock. So my interests are very much aligned with those of our shareholders, as is our chairman at uh, 280,000 shares and Marty Rendell, our CFO, at over 200,000 shares. So we're there with you. Analyst coverage, uh, six analysts cover Victoria, and there's a couple more uh, knocking on the door. I think uh, I'm not going to read through this, but you can see their 12 month uh, targets there. And uh, I think the common theme is that uh, Victoria is undervalued. Uh, management team, uh, you know, we've got a great team of people. The team on the left uh, has been together for pretty much 10 years. The guy in the bottom left, Tim Fish, we just added uh, at the beginning of October. Tim is a very experienced mine offer operator with a background in metallurgy. He complements well with Dave Rulo, who is also a very experienced mine operator, but is a mining engineer. Uh, another new hire is uh, on the right-hand side there, Adam Melnick. Some of you will know uh, Adam. He was uh, uh, an analyst most recently with Sun Valley Precious Metals. Uh, we've brought him into the team 
to bring some discipline to our review of potential opportunities for growth of Victoria. Board of Directors, also very important. Uh, this team of directors, uh, you know, Sean Harvey, Mike McGinnis, uh, Chris Hill and myself have all been together for more than 10 years on this journey. Uh, we felt we needed to add some bench strength and brought in Letha McLaughlin, who is an environmental uh, lawyer, Joe Offsenik, who's a, an engineer and a lawyer, formerly the CEO of Predium, just a great guy, and Steve Scott, who um, has spent many years with Rio Tinto on the commercial side. So greatly, great, highly experienced board of directors. Last but not least, ESG. Um, health and safety is very important to us. Uh, just last week, we reached a milestone of having worked two years without a lost time accident. But it's interesting to point out that we've only had three lost time accidents since we started construction in 2018 and have worked more than 5 million hours. Uh, community investment, we do have a, a benefits agreement with the local First Nations and have made probably more than $3 million in payments to the local First Nation. Um, we've also just recently made a payment to the Yukon government under their quartz mining royalty of $8.7 So we really are uh, uh, giving back to both the community and the territory. Environmental stewardship. You know, I uh, live in the Yukon uh, part-time, and I certainly don't want to screw up my own backyard. And I'm pleased to say we've had zero significant environmental incidents. And then a program that I'm very proud of is Yukoners at Work. Right from the start, we challenged the uh, HR department with having 50% of our employees from the Yukon. Uh, we've achieved that and a byproduct of that is that uh, the recruitment team have had to look at everybody a little closer and uh, we have 25% of our employees are women and 25% are First Nations. And I doubt there's another mining operation in North America that comes close to meeting those metrics. And uh, that brings us to the uh, conclusion. I think we're bang on time. Absolutely perfect. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, John, super. Do you want to say something to that, but or is that is just a summary? No, that's just the same summary okay. as we have. Super, yeah. perfect. Then let me stop that here. So let's go here to the questions. Um, all right. Yeah, first of all, thank you very much for the presentation. And I know why I'm a shareholder of the company. Uh, I... I I mean, I know you a long, long time, but I have a very high uh, opinion of you guys, of the team, but also what you have achieved in that uh, amount of time. And uh, the, uh, yeah, let's say the hiccups you had uh, the last months is they are all done with conveyor belts, with, uh, let's say, all transportation, etc. That is all fine, right? Yeah, I should maybe just elaborate on what happened with the conveyor belt. So, as I said in the beginning, uh, you know, this is a long conveyor. Uh, it uh, moves the ore 1.5 kilometers. So, the belt itself is actually three kilometers in length. Um, it was the original belt that we installed in uh, 2019. Um, and it had seven splices in it. So, it was seven pieces or six pieces of conveyor belt to uh, give you the three kilometers. And what happened is one of those splices pulled apart. Now, you know, no two conveyors like this are the same. So it's always hard to judge what the life of the conveyor belt is. Mm -hmm. And a conveyor belt is very similar to your radial tire. And with a radial tire, it's not usually the rubber that causes the problem. It's the steel in the tire that starts to split apart. And that's not 
That's very similar to what happened with this conveyor belt. So when we had the uh, splice pull apart, that was a good sign that we'd probably reached the life of this conveyor belt. So we made the tough decision. You know, we could have spliced it back together again and been back into production, but it would be very unpredictable where it would split again. Mm -hmm. um, so we made the decision to replace the belt. It meant shutting down for two and a half weeks, and uh, we had to retract our guidance for the year. Um, but for the long term uh, of the operation, it was the right thing to do. And for the safety of our employees, it was the right thing to do. Because when these belts pull apart, it's like taking a, a rubber band and pulling it until it breaks. There's a huge reaction of the belt. So right thing to do from uh, safety and protecting our employees and the right thing to do for the long term operations of Eagle. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Um, let's go to the resource expansion we saw on one slide. And there's also a question from a shareholder here and was also my question. Um, you are, chose now it goes down to a depth of 350 meters. This is what we saw so far. But now we talk about 850 meters. So how do you want to, let's call it mine that, or how do you want to get access to this? Would that still mean that you could do an open pit, maybe to deepen the open pit you have? Or would that require underground mining? No, I, I think at the grades we're at, uh, underground mining would never be economic. So it has to be open pit and would mean probably increasing the strip ratio from 1 to 1 to 1.6 to 1. Mm -hmm. um, so we're looking at the economics of that right now. But, you know, if you look at a mine like uh, Kinross's Fort Knox mine in Alaska, which is very similar to Eagle, both in terms of uh, geology and uh, uh, size, you know, they've done three pushbacks of the pit wall over the life of the mine. Mm -hmm. So it has to stand alone, you know, we'll treat it as like any other capital project and make a decision based on economics. But uh, we're fortunate that, you know, it's not a huge increase in strip ratio to get us down, say, another 200 meters. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, grade-wise, it is stable or is it slowly but surely getting higher when you go deeper? Uh, it looks very similar, both in terms of grade and recovery. Mm -hmm. Okay, super. Um, by now, you are, let's call it a one mine company, but we saw you have 550 square kilometers. And if I remember that back uh, also with uh, interviews with uh, Tara Christie from Banyan, um, I had the feeling that you might expand in the future with Raven, maybe with the Banyan properties, that, that it might be a second mine or a third mine even in the future. Is that something you would consider? Uh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, you know, you mentioned Banyan. They're about 30 kilometers south of us mm -hmm. as the crow flies. They have a resource now of over 4 million ounces. Mm -hmm. Um, they've had a significant drill program this year. I think they're approaching 60,000 meters of drilling. Uh, a little different uh, where they are in terms of weather. They're down in the bottom of the valley, so at a much lower uh, elevation. So they're still drilling. Uh, I drove by their drills uh, operating yesterday. They've got four drills still running. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I'm pretty sure Tara is going to keep the guys working until uh, probably the end of November and then shut down for a couple months and be started again early in February. But uh, there's certainly potential there for doubling that resource. Uh, they've still got some work to do on the metallurgical side. And, you know, we've been asked, well, why haven't you taken them over? Mm -hmm. um, we've got enough to do. You know, our focus is on Eagle getting it up and running properly as well. Now we have a, a, a primary development uh, or exploration and development project called Raven. So we're quite happy for them to uh, move Ormac is the name of the deposit forward and 
we'll keep a close eye on them. But I think it points to the fact that this is rapidly becoming a mining district. You know, you've got Eagle, you've got Raven, you've got Ormac. Hecla just purchased Alexco. Uh, they're a big multi-mine company. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, it bodes well for the Yukon and the Mayo mining region in particular. Mm -hmm. um, do you see Raven, because you mentioned it also, uh, as a similar open pit mine like Eagle then? Do you think that's possible? I know it's hypothetical for the regulators, but could that be the case? Yeah, you know, it's early days at Raven. Mm -hmm. um, I see a number of scenarios. Mm -hmm. You know, it could be that we truck the ore across to the uh, Eagle operation. Mm -hmm. could be that we put a leach pad out there and, uh, you know, pump the pregnant solution to Eagle for uh, processing. Um, it could be a standalone mining operation. Um, and the other thing that, uh, you know, we'll certainly look at is because it's of the grades, you know, it may be... Uh, Uh, you may be able to make a good case to put in a milling operation uh -huh. and get 90% recovery as opposed to 75% recovery. Okay. So, but it's early days. Uh, yeah. You know, I think we need a, probably a couple more seasons of drilling before we even consider uh, any engineering studies. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Then let's stick uh, with the Eagle Mine. We saw that you want to uh, bring up the staking to 85 to the 90 percent. And uh, I understood that uh, you have to invest, of course, some capital, like with that uh, semi-mobile crusher. So how about this capital? Is that capital already in the budgets? Do you have to use separate capital from the cash flow? And how much approximately do you think you have to invest? So to get the availability up and go from 160,000 ounces per year to 200,000 ounces per year uh, requires no additional capital. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that those ounces go to the bottom line. Mm -hmm. um, to go plus 200,000 ounces, say to 250,000, will require some capital. And, uh, you know, it's probably something... For a mobile crusher to put in a screening plant, those types of things, it's probably something less than 50 million. But, uh, you know, we're working our way through that right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, hang on. Um, your Dores. Uh, you said 85% gold, uh, then the next big part is silver, a little bit of tin, and some other metals. Do you have to pay any fines for the refineries, meaning with impurities? Do you have Are you facing any problems on that? Or is, let's say, the Doré quite uh, sober that you do not have to pay any fines? No, we don't pay any penalties. Uh, they the love penalties, our, yeah, sorry. They yeah. love our Doré bars. <laughs> And you love the money coming into your account. That's for sure. Me too. <laughs> Um, I saw also on your one slide uh, that you have still a debt open of $224 million, dollars, if I'm correct. And you still have a nice uh, cash situation of around $25, $29 million. Dollars. Um, you have uh, done last year, I think, over $60 million dollars down payments. Have you done this year also some down payments or even more down payments, uh, let's say extra down payments on the, on the credit balance? Yeah, we, you know, last year we paid down the debt about 60 million. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure where we'll end up this year. It's been a high sustaining capital mm -hmm. year. We'll probably pay down 30 million in debt. And mm -hmm. as I mentioned, uh, you know, there were two items uh, in sustaining capital. One was the water treatment plant. The mm -hmm. other was uh, two more trucks, haulage trucks. So mm -hmm. we won't have those sustaining capital in 2023. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, as long as gold price cooperates, uh, stays around where it is or higher, we'll significantly pay down debt next year. Mm -hmm. Super. So uh, you also mentioned the program 250 already. Have you pushed that a little bit 
out in the timing or are you still fully in that program? Because I'm, I had the feeling when I read your news releases, ah, the 250,000 ounces, this is something we really want to achieve 2023, 2024, but maybe that's a little bit pushed out time-wise? Yeah, you know, we've uh, I over, over promised and under delivered mm -hmm. and uh, you know, we've got to learn to walk before we run mm -hmm. so to speak and uh, you know our big target in 2023 is getting up to 200,000 ounces per year mm -hmm. once we achieve that then we'll look at options to go up to 250 but it's uh, you know pushed out and mm -hmm. you know to go to 250 will require capital mm -hmm. Yeah, th thanks for that very honest uh, statement. Uh, that's also quite rare that the CEO says, no, we have been a little bit too fast. <laughs> but that's normal. I mean, that's uh, that's why we are human beings and not robots, right? Um, share buybacks. You mentioned that. Uh, wouldn't it make sense to start already? Because your share price was so hammered. I'm a shareholder too, so I, I also suffer losses, even, despite I even bought early. But uh, yeah, it is crazy for such a great producer like you are doing the right things, honestly. Um, and, and your share price is crazy down. But uh, also we, we just received from Cormark, BMO, etc. all those researches. And uh, I think all the targets, and we saw it also in your presentation, but the new updates I saw the last 48 hours, we are all calling for, let's say, around 15 Canadian dollars. That's almost double from what it is today, right? So, right. Would it make sense to restart to start today with some share buybacks? Well, it's always a balancing act, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, as I said, a large portion of our free cash flow this year has been invested back into the business. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's, uh, you know, do you use the money to pay down debt or to do share buyback or to give dividends? And we've chosen to focus on debt repayment. Um, you know, I'm a bit old fashioned when it comes to debt. I uh, don't think my father ever owed anybody money. You know, before he'd buy a new car, he had to save up the money. Uh, so I've got that imprinted in my DNA. And uh, the sooner we get that debt paid down, the better I'll sleep at night. Mm, absolutely, me too. Yeah, because I hate that. Absolutely, totally with you. Um, there's also a question from a shareholder. How does the inflation situation affect you in your balance sheet or also, let's say, in your daily business? I mean, you said, for example, what I really liked is that you have bought more spare parts, more replacement stuff, that you raised it. So I think you are there more on the safe side. And also then you are inflation, let's call it a bit inflation hedged, because if you have some storage uh, you are a little bit more independent. But if you go in general with explosives, with, uh, I don't know, chemicals, whatever, what, what's the situation for you in the Yukon? Yeah, I mean, you know, fuel costs drive everything. Our largest cost center is uh, people, so labor. So we know where that one is. And, uh, you know, we gave everybody a 10% increase last January. Um, we'll probably have to do something similar this January. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, fuel, we were doing our budgets last year at this time for 2022. And uh, fuel was a leader of fuel, landed at Eagle, was costing us about $1.15 per liter Canadian. Mm -hmm. um, we thought we were being very conservative. In our budgets, we used a dollar forty-five per liter landed at Eagle in our budgets. Uh, fuel peaked in June at about a dollar ninety-five, and I think it's currently around a dollar sixty. So it's come back a fair ways, but it's still above our budget. Mm -hmm. And fuel affects everything. You know, we burn fuel in the uh, open pit. Um, you know, you mentioned explosives. Explosives are, uh, you know, ammonia nitrate and fuel oil. So mm -hmm. half the price of explosives is tied to fuel. Mm -hmm. uh, we move our people in and out by air. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think there's an airline that doesn't have a fuel surtax in place. Um, you know, our groceries come up by truck 
It's a long truck drive up from Mexico where we get most of our fruit and that. So we've seen significant increases in food costs. So, you know, and then you got your lubricants and all of that is directly related to fuel prices. So, um, you know, we should come in uh, very close to our guidance for all in sustaining costs. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, at around 14.25 per ounce. But, uh, you know, three years ago or four years ago, pre-pandemic, I was telling people we would be around 1,200 per ounce, all mm -hmm. in sustaining costs. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's uh, the way it's gone. And, uh, you know, you can claw back a little bit here and there, but uh, it, it's, it's tough to run a mine, and particularly if you use a lot of fuel. Mm, definitely. Would it make sense, maybe a stupid question, but would it make sense to, let's say, hedge some fuel by our contracts and stuff? Or is that, is that not possible? It probably would have made sense a year ago. Mm -hmm. um, but it's very expensive to hedge fuel. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not like hedging gold. There's a real business uh, hedging uh, gold. But fuel, you can, but it's very expensive because of the volatility in prices. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, then another uh, shareholder is asking around, or let's say he's doing a little statement. He's saying uh, the Fort Knox owner, Kinros Gold, uh, has already 19% in Victoria Gold. Is there something cooking? <laughs> uh, formerly, Kinross was a large shareholder. Yeah. Um, But, uh, you know, they, they own zero, as far as I know, of Victoria. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what I thought. But if you go back to the, you know, the original um, startup of Victoria, um, Victoria Resources was a company that was owned 40% by BEMA Resources. And in 2006, I think 2007, uh, Kinross bought BEMA. Mm -hmm. So they ended up with this company called Victoria Resources. And uh, then it was uh, a fellow named Hugh Agro was executive vice president of Kinross. Mm -hmm. And he approached our current chairman, Sean Harvey, and myself and asked if we'd repopulate the board of Victoria Resources. Mm -hmm. And he would join the board as well. And we hired Chad Williams as a CEO and At that time, we were a uh, Nevada-focused explorer. We had four Greenfields projects in Nevada. And then it was the financial crisis in 2008 and 2009. We saw that as an opportunity. And with Kinross's help, did a financing in November of 2008 when most company CEOs were hiding under their desks. And that gave us the ability to acquire two companies, a company called Gateway Gold, which gave us more assets in Nevada, and a company called Stratagold, which gave us the Eagle asset in the Yukon. Then over the next couple of years, we evaluated things and decided to focus on Eagle. And in 2010, 2011, we sold off all of our Nevada assets and realized probably close to 65 million in cash for those assets, which we use to develop Eagle. Mm -hmm. Okay, super. Then um, there is a question from a shareholder, maybe a little bit too far, too out, uh, that you can say that, but I still want to ask you, um, what is your, let's say, AISC planning for 2023, 2024, 2025? Also debt repayment for next year in, in two years. I think that's hard to yeah. say. <laughs> you know, I love to uh, talk about those numbers, but uh, regulators don't allow me to. Uh -huh. um, you know, I think uh, you can do the math and use something. You know, I've already said our sustaining capital next year will be uh, uh, half of what it was this year. And our production will be closer to 200,000 ounces per year. So mm -hmm. you can do the math and figure out what the, uh, you know, mm -hmm. what my thoughts are on uh, ASICs in 2023. Mm. Uh, 
Yeah, absolutely. And also with the debt repayment, I mean, if you could do the pace you had so far, I could imagine within approximately four years, that should be done, right? Um, I'd say less than that. I'd okay. say, you know, our goal is by the end of 2024 to have the debt completely paid down. Now, there's lots of factors that come mm. into that, you know, uh, you know, hopefully it's uh, good problems like Raven has evolved into a 10 million ounce deposit and we're <laughs> plowing all our free cash flow into its development. But uh, yeah. you know, we'll see. Yeah, but I, honestly, I love those luxury problems. Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> a question is, you are a gold miner. What, how do you see personally, and I don't want to have the statement as a company, but now personally also, because then you can talk a bit more free. Um, how do you see the gold price in that inflationary um, environment we see? Because I think none of our viewers here is really believing that that gold price makes any sense with an inflation above 10%. And uh, what is your feeling uh, regarding, let's say, COMEX, uh, the physical storage is halved already yeah but what are your thoughts on that i mean you you are so long in the in the precious metal markets i would say what is your can you can you compare this with some experiences you had in the past or can you give us a bit of a statement please <laughs> well you know people always think that you're the ceo of a gold mining company you must know something about the price of gold and you know my answer these days is i'm, I'm a mining engineer Go mm -hmm. talk to an economist because I just don't understand what's going on. I read a lot and I don't understand why gold isn't $2,500 per ounce right now, considering what, uh, you know, governments around the world are doing. We've got, you know, wars in, in Europe. We've got threats of wars in Asia. You know, the North Koreans and the South Koreans are going at it again and, you know, it's unfortunate that it takes those kinds of things to raise the price of gold, but I really don't understand why gold isn't much higher than where it is. Mm, definitely, me too. Um, there also popped up another question from a shareholder. Um, to what weather, um, or let's say extreme weather extent or event, you still can produce your gold, meaning still the leaching is working. Um, as we, we we had the last two winters were very tough because of the of the La Nina effect, and this year it looks a little bit like that maybe the winters might, yeah, become a little bit milder. Is is there something where, where where you can say okay, if it's not going, let's say below minus ten or minus fifteen, we still can work, or is that something you you can say no? It it really depends on how the stacking and uh, the leaching is uh, running. Yeah, we've got, uh, you know, three winters behind us now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we spent a lot of time at Kinross's Fort Knox mine prior to building mm -hmm. Eagle. So we have a pretty good uh, idea how to handle winter. Mm -hmm. uh, myself, I've spent my entire career in Canada's Arctic, you know, first the Nunavut, then the NWT, now I'm in the Yukon. Um, but... You know, we see zero impact on the leach pad of winter. Um, mm -hmm. You know, last year, for example, we we monitor the temperature of the barren solution going on to the pad and the pregnant solution coming off the pad. And it's generally around eight degrees uh, Celsius going on to the pad. And uh, the lowest it's ever got was May two years ago, got down to three degrees. So, and, you know, by May, that's not a concern at all because it's getting warm again. But uh, so there's no impact of the weather on the pad. You know, we've got more than 25 million tons on that pad now. It's a huge heat source, you know, and... Uh, you know, even in the winter, if you go out onto the leach pad, it's a little bit mushy. Mm -hmm. So it generates generates a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay, super. So let me go through that here. I should expand on yeah. that, though. You know, in the open pit, if the temperature drops below minus 35, mm -hmm. we do shut the mining equipment down. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and I think we've lost, since we started production those three winters, we've lost probably eight days of mining because of cold temperatures. But, it, you know, below minus 35, you just don't want to break things and equipment breaks at that. But fortunately, we see very few days below that temperature. Mm -hmm. Okay, super. Perfect. John, I do not see any additional questions here. I think we have answered everything. Also, my list is empty. That's perfect. Thank you very much for a great hour and a great presentation. And I would say keep it going. Please get the AIC back on track. I'm pretty sure you can do that next year because you had a lot of one-time events. And uh, yeah, keep on going to pay back the debt uh, to make us all sleep very nicely on uh, during the night <laughs> and start some share buybacks maybe and then by 2025 I want to see some dividends. <laughs> Super. All right, John, thank you very much. Have a great day and all the best. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, that was our virtual roadshow with John McConnell, the CEO of Victoria Gold. And uh, yeah, you heard it. Despite some hiccups, things are really uh, working now the smooth way. That's exactly how we want it. And uh, also the company is still paying their debt uh, back and they want to have that done by the end of next year. Yeah, and also probably some share buybacks will arise quite soon. Hopefully that uh, that is a great tool uh, yeah, to uh, create some more shareholder value and also dividends is something which the company really has on the plan. We like that a lot and uh, yeah, for next year, 200,000 ounces production would be great. As said, with uh, greatly falling AICs, hopefully, and making more money and higher margins, that would be great. So far, the company did everything right and as you know, mining is an adventure. It's not something that you are pushing a button and you are fine. Uh, there's always something could happen, but the company managed every hiccup greatly so far. So thanks for watching us today. I wish you all the best. Stay healthy and bye-bye from Switzerland. John, bye-bye. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye-bye.